Hey everybody, welcome back to the garage and today I've decided to take a break from mowing because it is hot as hell out there to do a video that a lot of you guys have been asking me specifically to do and that is setting up for speed density tuning on the Gen 3 platform. It is pretty much the same thing that we do on the 4 and 5 but it's a little bit simpler but we will touch on the specific things that we're wanting to do. Uh, much like everything else, I'm going to throw the disclaimer out there. This is going to show you how to do tuning. You do this at your own risk, yada, yada, yada. So I'll be right back. This video is intended for educational purposes only. Improper tuning can cause catastrophic mechanical damage, and you should do your own research before attempting any changes like this to a vehicle. Attempt custom tuning at your own risk. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about speed density tuning real quick and what it is, why we do it, and what we need to do to get set up to do it. Well, speed density is basically just using the map sensor along with some other sensors to use a volumetric efficiency calculation to determine how much air the engine is breathing in. Then it calculates versus that air how much fuel is required in order to reach your commanded AFR, which we will be talking about AFR a lot on uh, this because it's Gen 3. Most of you will be tuning on AFR as opposed to Lambda. Uh, I will do a video later on specifically talking about how to convert from AFR into Lambda, but you also need to remember that if you're doing that, it will not work if you have some kind of flex fuel going on, if you're using an alcohol sensor. That math is a strictly convert this number to this number, but once this number starts shifting, it gets wonky. So just bear in mind that if you're wanting to do E85 on a Gen 3, it might be a little bit more complicated uh, unless you are specifically dialing in your speed density map just for that. That all being said, what we have to do to enable speed density is a couple simple things. We, and we'll go through here and double check some of this other stuff because I haven't dove into a Gen 3 ECU in so long, but we've got to disable the MAF sensor. Uh, that's the number one thing that we always want to do is disable the MAF sensor. In theory, whenever we do that, it should keep us out of dynamic airflow. Dynamic airflow is whenever you use both the MAF sensor and the speed density together. Effectively, what you are doing is you're taking your volume, your air volume, from the MAF sensor, and then you're doing a sanity check versus your speed density or your VE tables. And if there is some variation on that, a lot of times it will default back strictly to your VE tables because they're a little bit more hard-coded in math, and they are, uh, well, a MAF sensor is a little less prone to having erroneous readings unlike MAF sensors. Even MAF sensors of today, uh, still have issues and that's why you see platforms like the Jeep Wrangler does not run a map it runs speed density only because anything that's designed really to go off-road and get dirt in it has a tendency to foul a math sensor out let's go ahead I've got it pulled up I've got a uh, 2002 Camaro pulled up here and we will just dive straight in and first things first what we always do is go into the engine diagnostics and we will fail the mass airflow sensor and so basically we're always looking for this frequency fail high that's the easiest way to make sure that it does fail. On this one, we're also going to set the DTC to fail on first air so we get that check engine light right off the bat. The other option that you can do, but you need to double check and see whether or not the intake air temp sensor is built into your map, is just unplug your map sensor. I prefer to do it this way. That way you know all, if there is additional sensors built into your map sensor, you still have those. This basically just makes it say, oh crap, I'm, I'm not working right off the bat. So we will set this to zero. So as soon as we turn it on, it will fail. And then as I said, if you look down here in the corner, uh, we have this DTC here, and this is the one that we wanna set to uh, light up on the first error. So we'll jump over to P0103, scroll down here. Oh, well, don't have to scroll down on these, man. I love the old Gen 3s, they're so simple. And there it is, it's on mill on second error. We will change this over to mill on first error. And that way we will know right away as soon as we start the car, we should get a check engine light informing us that the math has failed. We can also pull that DTC through the scanner and verify it there. Okay, we're gonna start underneath the engine airflow general tab. And here you can see that you actually have the input characteristics for your map sensor. If you go from a one bar to a two bar or a three bar on these, you can put the information in here. Where you run into the issue is you need a custom OS. And that is if you look underneath the main VE here, 
it maxes out at 1.05 on your map. And you can't actually expand this table out like you can on the later generations. If you go in the row axis, you can't edit it. On a Gen 4 and a Gen 5, you can edit it directly in there and make this table bigger. So what we need to do on that situation, and I'm not going to do it here because this I don't have access to this tune, but you go in under OS and you will have these code modifications where you can go to a 2-bar or a 3-bar. And these will not show up unless your ECU supports those. So that's something to keep in mind. I'm not going to go too far off into it, but if you get into boost, uh, uh, tuning on these older Gen 3 engines and you will have to go in and put a custom OS in there. But we will come back to this in a bit and look at our primary VE table for now. Let's go ahead and go over into dynamic air. And something on this one, I always like to do the high RPM disabled. And if you look at the description down below, it says above this RPM use filtered math air mass uh, for predicted calculations. And that's saying, that's generally when it switches over at 4,000 RPMs in this case, it would try and use only the map. We're gonna max this out. It's, you know, 10,000 RPMs should be pretty good unless you're building an F1 car. You know, if you got a flat plane crank, you probably don't need me to show you how to do tuning. I'm just saying. That's about all we need to do. Dynamic airflow should be disabled anyways because of us failing the math, but this gives you a little bit of peace of mind knowing that the math is not going to be enabled. Okay, next let's go ahead and jump into the fuel oxygen sensors, and here's where we find the closed loop enable, and this is a coolant temp versus IAT. We're going to go ahead and max out the coolant temp. It says 285, but we want to go one below, so let's go down to 284 equals that and then we just want to disable long-term fuel trim so that takes those out of the equation uh, there's nothing under open loop that we would normally do on the other ones uh, like we do on the other ones but on temperature control we will disable the cat over temp and on the dfco uh, we want to crank uh, our dfco enable etc to 284 and that will keep deceleration fuel cutoff from kicking in and that's about it. That should set us up pretty good uh, for doing speed density tuning. But now we actually have to set up the histogram. So let's go back to our airflow, uh, our general tab, and open up our primary VE, and we will jump into... Okay, now that we've got all that done, we need to go ahead and save a new copy of this. We have the ass found already. This is going to be our tune step one. I can't save this because it's not licensed, but this is where you would save it as step one and start tuning against this one. Load this one into your vehicle, and then we will go and set up the histogram. So I've got the scanner pulled up, and this is a 2001 Pontiac, the closest thing that I had a scan file for versus the 2002 uh, Camaro that we were just building off of. But we need to go up and uh, go ahead and set up our speed density histogram. So. Uh, you need to have these specific PIDs in order to build this histogram. Engine RPM, map pressure in bar, uh, your wideband AFR reading, and then your commanded AFR. We will use those four PFIDs, PFIDs, we will use those four PIDs to build or collect our data, which will then be viewed in our histogram. As you can see, we do not have the histogram set up here yet, but we can still look at data after the fact. I've talked about that in the past where you can build a histogram and use old logs to see things like your error ratios. But let's go ahead and add a new graph in here, add a new table. And the first thing that we want to add is our AFR error. So come all the way down to the bottom into Lambda and AFR. Bring in our AFR error. And I'm going to put this as 2002 SD error. See that's already a percentage. I like to bump this out to two decimal points. And then on cell hits, I start around 15. You can go 20 or 25 if you want to get more accurate data. Make sure that your views in average. It's there by default. And then I like to add some shading. So if we put 25, that's 25% lean. Uh, we can add that to red. And then we can put negative 25, which is going to be 25% rich, and put that to green. Now we will go ahead and add our RPM in. That's our primary, our column axis. And if it, if it questions whether or not you want to use generic sensors, you're fine using generics on this. But now that we've got our RPM in, let's jump back over to our VE table, open it up, and copy our column axis labels. That makes it a little bit easier than us trying to manually put all these things in. Now we can just paste it in, and there it is. We'll do the same thing. We're going to add manifold. Actually, we just do map. Uh, manifold absolute pressure. It'll ask if we want to use the generic one. We'll go ahead and do that. 
and then we'll jump back over and now we will copy our row of axis labels and paste those into our histogram. Boom, we're done. Uh, now, if we look at our 2002 speed density, there is data in there and this one is very rich. We can come through here, look at some of these different cells and see that they're 12% rich. And if you look over here, the commanded versus the actual, this is very rich. They're commanding 14.1 and actually seeing 11.5. So that all looks good. Uh, and that's basically it. After that, you go in, you pull your tune, you copy uh, your log, and then we want to go back over to our VE table, highlight ent our entire VE table, and then we want to use paste special, multiply by half. We don't ever really want to use the full multiply thing because we will end up overshooting our correction and we will what basically cause oscillation where we go lean to rich, lean to rich. So I try to use that multiply by half. And then if you've got areas in here, like we know that this 84 is, this is why I love Gen 3s. This 84 is probably off because we're 82 here, 81 here, and 83. So best bet is we can put this to an 83 for now. And then kind of the same ordeals. We've got some issues over here that we can use interpolation to fill some of these in. And an 88 is pretty good if you follow that across. It's not getting too wild, but we can fill most of these in and get a better idea of what these will be on these blank spots. And it works so well on the Gen 3s. It's a little, little more complicated on the Gen 4s but and the Gen 5s, but it works really well on here. Now we've got some changes in here. Oh, we missed a spot. Let's fill that one in. It's probably going to be eh, 87. If we interpolate it this way, we'll see if it stays the same. It actually goes up to 88. I like it at 87, though. We can also look at the map manually, and it's got some bumps, but I'll be honest with you, if your map is completely smooth, that's because it is a factory default style map that is just thrown into every vehicle. As you tune in specific vehicles with different modifications and stuff on there, your map will start to get lumpy, and that's perfectly normal. We are dialing in the speed density map specific to our own vehicles, so just keep that in mind. Now that that's done, we will save this as step two, rinse and repeat, keep going out there, logging that data over and over, applying it, and then eventually you will get to the point where this table here in your scanner is within two or three percent. At that point in time, go ahead, kick it back over, put dynamic back on, put your O2 sensors back in, uh, enable your long-term fuel trims, and your long-term fuel trims will pick up that last like two percent, no problem. So I wouldn't get too obsessed about trying to get closer than two or three uh, percent because you'll get to a point where you'll just end up shooting one direction or the other. I'll be honest with you, I don't know with the way that these maps are set up with it being whole numbers like a 96 that you can do much more than that because a shift from 96 to 97 on this one cell right here uh, might cause you to swing too far one way or the other way. And so we can use the long-term fuel terms to kind of nudge it to where it needs to be. So we're not looking for uh, dead nuts accuracy on this thing. Set 2%, 3%, you're probably good enough. And if you are concerned about it, error to 2 3% on the rich side, as opposed to you know making sure that you don't have any lean spots on the map. That's generally what I do. It's what I'm doing right now on the, on the Silverado tuning uh, for the, the supercharger setup now. So... Uh, that's basically it. That is speed density tuning in a nutshell for the Gen 3s. If you have any questions, make sure and hit up the comments below. If you haven't already, subscribe. We're going to be touching on a bunch of different topics. I'm going to try and do more specific generational videos for you guys out there that have these specific questions on how to do it on your platform to shed some better light on the ways of making this happen. As always, if you, know, if you want me to review your tunes or anything like that, hit up the Patreon. Hit up the, the questions, you know, and and ask them here because I am trying my best to make sure and get back to you guys in a timely manner with, with answers that will help you out. As always, man, I got to thank everybody who's been supporting the channel, all the new subscribers. You guys are amazing. Uh, you, you know, keep me going, keep me want to make content for you guys. So, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to watch these videos, comment, make suggestions and everything else. So once again, thanks for stopping by the garage.